Hey, Lyric here. This week, I am going to be revisiting a topic I've already touched on in the past. I think it's important to periodically revisit subjects because as we grow, our understanding of different things evolves and changes. Since it's been a few years since I've done this topic, I thought it was about time to do an update. So what is this topic I'm redoing this year? That topic is stimming. Stimming! Whee! We'll talk a little bit about sensory seeking too. If you're at all curious about stimming and sensory seeking, please do stay tuned. All right, so first, let me start with this very neurotypical medical definition of stimming, and then we'll unpack that and talk about the human experience of stimming. So stimming is defined as, and I'm reading off of Wikipedia today, self-stimulatory behavior. That sounds really dirty, first of all, and it's not typically that, what you might be thinking when you read that, although I don't see why it couldn't be that. Let me continue to read the definition. I think you'll understand what I mean by that as I dive in. Also known as stimming and self-stimulation. It is the repetition of physical movements, sounds, words, or moving objects. Such behaviors, ew, scientifically known as stereotypes, are found to some degree in all people, especially those with developmental disabilities, and are especially frequent in autistic people. People diagnosed with sensory processing disorder are also known to potentially exhibit stimming behaviors. Okay, so what does all of that blah mean? One thing I would like to say before we move forward and point out is that every single human being and even non-human beings sometimes stim. It's not only autistic people that stim. It did say that in the definition, but I want to point that out because that's really important. Every human stims to some degree, chewing, clicking your pen, tapping your fingers, things like that. But the degree and the intensity to which autistic and neurodivergent people, people with sensory processing disorder and differences stim, we stim a lot more. We stim constantly. Some of us, not all of us, we're all different. We're all unique. We're not a monolith. But those of us who are stimmy, I'm a very stimmy autistic, for a lot of us, myself included, stimming can be as natural to us as breathing. Not to stim can take a lot of work, focus, and concentration, and also often will have consequences. For example, if I try to hold my body still, I have to do that by holding my body very stiff and very tense. You will find me having tension in my body, getting lots of knots throughout my body. I've actually had like jaw pain and jaw problems from clenching my teeth and giving myself headaches from clenching and holding everything in. It's, it's, it's like, Elsa, conceal, don't feel, don't let them know, hide, be still, be normal, darn you. No, I, I can't do it anymore. It, it had physical impacts on my health when I did hold the stimming in because that energy, as I'll talk about in a minute, comes from somewhere and has to go somewhere. Something else that's really important that I want everyone to understand about stimming that I think is confusing to some people who don't have stimmy brains is how important stimming is and how there are different types of stimming. Neurotypicals all lump it in under one thing in one definition. There is involuntary stimming, the stimming that many autistic and neurodivergent people do that we don't even realize is happening. That is the rocking, the clapping and flapping when we're excited, the jumping up and down for joy, 
the pacing back and forth that happens without me realizing I'm doing it. This, this rocking stuff right now, because I'm getting really amped up and energized. And so my body is getting filled with energy and it just has to move to release some of that. I don't even realize I'm doing it most of the time, or I become aware I'm doing it and I have the opportunity to force myself to stop, which is a very mindful process where I have to like force myself to stop. As I said, I will be clinching and doing other things because that energy that has come into my body still is there and still has to go somewhere, whether I get it out in a way that works well for me or not. If I stop stimming and flapping and jumping and getting the energy out in those ways, I will then start picking my skin. My hands will wander to my face and I'll start picking at my face and at my skin without even realizing I'm doing it. I may start biting at my nails. I may start biting and chewing the inside of my mouth and the inside of my lips. I switched from stimming in a way that is visible to stimming in a way that is air quotes, socially acceptable. And a lot of the air quotes, socially acceptable ways my energy comes out when I am holding in my stims are ways that are actually harmful to me. Being asked to hold in my stims is harmful to me because as an autistic person, those involuntary stims that occur as a response to my emotional reactions, joy, fear, excited, worried, those things make me stim. The emotions create energy in me. I have an intense emotional and an intense sensory experience. So sensory things will also make me stim. Those stims that come out subconsciously are part of my autistic body language. Imagine if we asked neurotypicals, hey, I don't like your body language. You need to be very mindful to change your body language. Your body language is natural and is a reflection of how you feel. Asking autistic people to change, stifle, or hide their involuntary stims is like asking us to change and hide our body language, which is an extension of how we're feeling by asking us to hide, tone down, and mute our stims for you. Asking us to hide and tone down our feelings and emotional and sensory experience. Asking us to act like everything's okay or everything is one way when it's another way. So now that we've talked about involuntary stimming, let's talk about stimming that is more intentional. The stimming that actually often is more tied to sensory seeking, in my opinion, but neurotypicals and everyone else call it stimming because it is still repetitive behaviors. So sensory seeking, stimming, stimulating your senses, right? This is stimulating two senses right now, the sense of sound and the sense of touch, because it's this wiggly thing in my hands. You may have noticed if you've been with me for a while, my hands are always in motion. Often if they are not in motion above the table, they are in motion below the table. Having something in my hands keeps them busy in a way that keeps them out of trouble, like picking my face and those other things I mentioned earlier. Since finding out I'm autistic and starting to understand more about sensory processing differences and my own sensory profile and figuring out a good sensory diet for myself, I have been a lot more mindful in engaging in intentional stimming slash sensory seeking with various stim tools and items. I know that it's helpful for me to stimulate my sense of sound myself because I find sounds from other people often to be painful, overwhelming, and can cause sensory overload for me. Also, since I am very sensitive to touch, having things I can touch that are pleasant, having control over the sense that often is overwhelming to me can be helpful. As a young person, I remember, for example, laying on the floor and playing with 
pinwheels and box fans just sitting and staring at the spinning and also with the box fan did anyone else ever do this that thing where the fan is spinning and you're like rolling into the fan and it's changing your voice which was me verbally stimming stimming by using words and sounds so that I could hear sounds that I am in control over do you verbal stim I am still, as an adult, someone who is constantly verbally stimming with sounds, music, quotes from movies, shows, commercials, and other randomy things, uh, which if you've ever been to one of my Facebook live streams, you might know already. One thing I need to mention, because it's really important before we move on, is that stimming can be dangerous. It can be hurtful. For example, in overwhelming situations in the past, I have banged my head on things, punched myself in the face, punched my legs, broken things, smashed things, and this sucks when it happens. I want people to understand that when these stims that are harmful to person or property happen, they are often a reaction to a very, very intense experience. I'm hitting myself because I am in an extreme physical or emotional pain. The pain is so bad that hitting myself is a pleasant distraction from it, is the best way I can describe this when you get in that really intense overwhelm, whether that's an emotional overwhelm or a physical overwhelm from something like a toothache or intense emotional pain that's an intense emotional energy. It has to come out. There needs to be some kind of a high energy solution to get that out. And punching myself in the leg might not be the best answer, but it's better than punching myself in the face. So let me do that if I need to punch myself in the leg. Just let me do it, okay? Quick recap before we go. Stimming is something every human being does and something that many non-humans also do tigers pacing in the zoo, for example. Stimming is something that, for those of us who do it, is very natural, as natural as breathing for many of us. There are types of stimming. There's involuntary stimming, stimming that we don't realize is happening often until we are pointed out or we the see people staring at us and we realize we've done something that has gotten the attention of those around us. Those types of stims that come subconsciously are also part of an autistic and neurodivergent person's body language. They are part of our emotional expression. Also, in addition, there are stims, sensory seeking, that can be done intentionally and can be great avenues of self-care for minds who need sensory input. There's also real danger from stims that can cause self-harm. And we need to realize that those intense moments of overwhelm are a person feeling very out of control and needing to calm back down and feel safe. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me this week as I did this little recap, deep dive into stimming and neurodivergent stimming, autistic stimming, human stimming. If you are a stimmy human, I would love to hear from you. Drop a comment in the comments below with your favorite involuntary sensory seeky stim that you go to when you know you need a good stim. This is my current one right now, this little sluggy. Rainbow articulated sluggy, awesome. What's your what's your go-to? Also, what what's your most common involuntary stim that you do when you don't realize you're even stimming? I would say for me, it would probably be rocking uh, or if I'm standing, pacing. Drop a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks to everyone who comments, shares, 
subscribes. If you're still here and you watch the end of the video and you made it this far, if you can hit the thumbs up, thank you for doing that because that lets me know that I did a video that was on topic enough to keep you here all the way to the end. Yay! It's hard for me. I, I tend to veer all over the place. I'm a bit scattery if you haven't noticed. So if you're still here, thanks. Hitting that thumbs up is helpful to me to let me know that. Thanks to everyone who comments, subscribes, hits that thumbs up, lets me know you're here. The Facebook supporters, the YouTube channel members, the Patreon supporters, subscribers, the Twitter super followers. Thanks for doing that monetary subscription to help pay for things like website hosting, transcriptioning software, the technology that this, this blog is created using. I could not do this without you. I am just an autistic in an RV with a laptop and a microphone. So thank you all for being a huge part of this. This blog is literally made possible thanks to the support of viewers like you. I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.